طيب سيدي بركان عاد اذنك نبدا ان شاء الله سيدي آه تفضل سيدي الله يعطيك العافيه الله يعطيك الصحه السلام عليكم مساء الخير سيدي بركان يعطيك العافيه هلا سيدي فين تحكي معنا؟ من من اربيل من اربيل في اربيل الله يعطيك الف عافيه سيدي ان شاء الله احنا يعني الحمد لله يعني كدائره وكبرنامج علمي يعني احنا نخترق الحدود ان شاء الله برنامج ان شاء الله سيدي ان شاء الله الله يعطيك العافيه يا سيدي ان شاء الله شكرا لوجودك معنا ودعمك الدائم سيدي الله يسلمك 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 مستر خير شباب يعطيكم الف عافيه صراحه احنا السبجكت اللي عندنا اليوم تف شوي اوكي بنحاول نكون شوي مركزين راح احاول انه يكون في انتراكشن بس يعني الموضوع كثير اكستنسيف اوكي فممكن يكون هذا الانتراكشن شوي ليميتد اوكي للديتيلز الموجوده اول شيء طبعا راح نحكي عن الاناتومي اوف ديستال هيمورس الابيديمولوجي اوف ديستال هيمورس فراكشر الايمجينج فراكشر كلاسيفيكيشن المانجمنت different modalities with surgical approaches with surgical techniques or any uh, uh, bit falls uh, for this fracture. I want to start with the anatomy. This is the humerus is part of the elbow joint. It's a, a trochoganglioid joint. What does this mean? It means uh, that it has two parts of motion. Troco means the trochoid, which is rotatory movement, rotational movement. This is something related to the radiocapitular articulation and the ginglimoid part. It's related to the ulnar humeral articulation, which is a hinge uh, joint. Now, it's important شباب, يعني, to be يعني, highly oriented on the distal humerus anatomy because this is very crucial for your management and is very important for the understanding of uh, uh, the fracture itself or the operative planning. And, for all the decisions that are related to the management of this uh, fracture. Now, we are at the left side, we are looking at the anterior uh, uh, surface of the uh, distal humerus, okay? It's composed of two columns, the lateral column and the medial column, and an articular surface that connecting these two columns, okay? Now, it's very important to know that the lateral column is diverging in a 20 degrees, while the medial column is diverging in a more uh, uh, inclination around 40, 45 degrees. The uh, articular surface composed of two components, uh, the trochlea and the capitulum. Uh, the capitulum is actually an extension of the uh, lateral column, while the trochlea is the part of the articular surface that's connecting the two columns. So it comes in the center between the two columns. Now, the capitulum is actually uh, forming around 180 degrees. And the capitulum is, is not extending posteriorly. You can see the right side of the image, uh, the posterior uh, part of the lateral column, it's devoid of cartilage, while the trochlea form around 270 degrees, and a third arbor circle uh, uh, from the distal humerus. Uh, this part is the ulcranon fossa, uh, the, sorry, is the coronoid fossa that receives the coronoid process. This part is the radial fossa that receives the radial head. And posteriorly, we have this large process, okay, large fossa, which receives the large uh, olecranon process. We have medial and the lateral subrocondylar ridge. Please notice that uh, the trochlea, the medial side of the trochlea, trochlea itself is a spool like shape. Spool, yani bakara, zil bakara, okay. The medial part of the trochlea is extending distally compared to the lateral part and compared to the capitulum. As so what is the anatomical advantage? This will result in a total valgus alignment of the elbow. Please notice that this is the lateral subrocondylar ridge. Okay, uh, the ridge is inclining, okay, is inclining anteriorly uh, with the lateral column and the capitulum, 
while the medial supracondylar ridge is actually extending in a vertical, just in line with the medial column without being inclined anteriorly. As we notice, at 180 degrees cartilage, the left side is the capitella. For the trochlea, it's 270 degrees. Okay. Now, this part is, is very important for our management because usually when you go and put plate, you can extend the plate distally. Uh, this is a sagittal section of the distal humerus. Okay. Please uh, note the coronoid fossa, the auricular fossa. Please also notice these, this narrow corridor, okay, because when you are putting screws in the distal humerus, it's very important for the screws to be within this zone, not to be extending posteriorly or, or violating the articular cartilage or violating any of these fossils. This is a cross-sectional anatomy. Uh, please note that it's more cylindrical in the physical part, and it becomes, takes a, take a triangular shape when it comes uh, distally. Again, this is uh, an axial view uh, of the uh, distal humerus. You can notice that the capitulum is just, the cartilage is reaching just uh, the cartilage. Okay, okay. and please uh, notice the central location of the trochlea. Now, as we see it, as the trochlea is extending a little bit distal, this will give us a valgus, okay, uh, 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 valgus orientation for distal humerus. This, along with the anatomy of the proximal uh, forearm, is responsible for what's known as the carrying angle. You can note the inclination of the articular surface, which is around 40 degrees. Uh, it's also important to note that by, by taking this the center of the capitulum, okay, into account and connecting a line to the center, uh, to the central axis of the trochlea. Please notice that the whole distal humerus is internally rotated. This actually will lead to a, some sort of varus during flexion. This is the normal physiological varus during flexion that uh, takes place uh, in relative to this anatomy. This to improve the functionality. Now it's not also it's not about the bone only. There is a uh, very important ligamentous structure surrounding the distal humerus. Uh, you can see on the left side, this is called the lateral collateral complex. Oh, it's, composed of, it's composed of the following part, the annular ligament. The annular ligament is covering the lesser notch, okay, uh, which is the articulation between the radial head and the proximal ulna. Uh, and this is the radial collateral ligament. If you want to imagine it, you can imagine it on a shape that is mahrut. Imagine that this is the base of the cone, okay, and this is the surface of the cone where the radial collateral ligament actually inserts on the annular ligament, okay, and originates from the lateral epicondyle. And finally, we have the important part of the most important part of the lateral collateral ligament complex, which is the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, which provides uh, a posterior lateral rotatory instability and pro uh, provides uh, resistance against virus stress. Now, <clears throat> on the other side, okay, and and uh, uh, you should you should be highly oriented uh, 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 on the anatomy because when we go for example when you go for the lateral approach you should not violate the lateral uh, the LCL complex, okay. And uh, uh, when you go for some sort of olecranal osteotomy or posterior approach, also you should be careful about the dissection regarding the insertion of the complex, okay, in order to avoid any future instability. For the medial part, we have the medial collateral ligament, which is composed of the anterior part, which is the most important, that resists valgus, the resist valgus stress. We have uh, also the posterior part and the transverse part. Uh, again, we are done with the bony anatomy, with the ligamentous anatomy. There is surrounding neurovascular structures. We should be oriented about these structures. The ulnar nerve expresses the medial septum at the middle third of arm. Under ligament of struthers in 70% and cubital tunnel under Osborne ligament, and then continues its way between the two flexor carbonaris heads uh, regarding the radial nerve. Radial nerve runs 
in the spiral groove, in the posterior aspect of the humerus. It's important to know again that it goes in spiral groove 20 centimeter above the medial epicondyle, which uh, represents 74% of the humeral length. And it's go, it goes outside the spiral groove 14 centimeters above the lateral epicondyle, which forms a 51% of the humerus length. It's also very, impo very important to know that it pierces the lateral septum 10 centimeters above lateral epicondyle, which is 36% of the length of the humerus. So these numbers, these figures are really important, okay, because your approaches uh, will depend uh, mainly on your knowledge of the anatomy and being a safe surgeon is being a surgeon who have a good knowledge in the anatomy. Now, this is uh, this uh, picture represents the vascularity around the distal humerus. Um, there is too much arteries, too much branches, but I want you to know that there are three arcades. We have the medial arcade, we have the lateral arcade, we have the posterior arcade. Please notice that the distal humerus is a well-vascularized, actually. It's a well-vascularized uh, uh, pony, structure, pony anatomy. Uh, and this why sometimes you m might uh, uh, fix a, a, a completely de 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 vitalized fragment or devascularized fragment, okay, lose the fragment, you fix it, and with time it get, in get uh, blood supply and get incorporated into the fracture and be a part of the healing process. <clears throat> now, what, is, what are the limits of the distal humerus? Uh, this is the area, it is considered uh, an area of distal humerus. Actually, this concept was invented by a scientist called Muller. Uh, he said that the area of distal humerus uh, is the area where the epicenter located within a square whose base is distance between the epicondyles on the anterior posterior radiograph. Okay, so uh, we will draw a square where the length of the limb is the distance between the lateral and, and medial epicondyle and level uh, extending vertically and horizontally by this distance. Okay, now <clears throat> uh, we are physicians rather than surgeons. Okay. We should know what is the uh, size of this problem. What is uh, the significance, okay, of knowing the epidemiology of this problem? Now, 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 elbow fractures actually um, form forms around seven percent of adult fractures. Okay, one third, one third of elbow fractures are distal humerus fracture. Uh, this fracture has a bimodal age. Okay, males takes place usually between 12 and 19 years in females okay it's 80 years and older so this actually leads us to bimodal distribution uh and this uh, is uh, um, classified okay uh, or caused by either high uh, grade injury or low grade injury high grade injury in young and low grade injury in, in, in elderly usually the most common cause is simple falling down uh, Extra articular uh, is the major proportion of these fractures forming around 40%. Okay, bicolumnar fracture, 37%. Now, please, please concentrate on this sentence. Uh, actually, this because of increasing life expectancy and decreasing the uh, healthcare facilities, okay, the, compared to the past, there is a two-fold increase in incidence of this fracture. Okay, and it's estimated that this fracture is going to be three folds by 2030. So, uh, mainstay of the management is a prevention because of the economical cost of this fracture. How can we do this? By bone density screening and assessment of the following risk, where it is uh, uh, assessed by multiple factors such as age, weight, morbidity, smoking previous fractures, mother hip fractures, okay. And there is an entity of distal humerus fracture. It is a partial articular fracture. Uh, if you notice that uh, the capitulum actually located uh, uh, just anterior to the humeral axis, okay. So as the center of rotation of the capitulum is just anterior to the humeral axis, 
this will uh, lead to a shearing forces, okay, with an uh, uh, axial load. Uh, the partial articular fractures are bimodal distribution and takes place also in elderly female because of the carrying angle and osteoporosis. Now, history of an exam is important, these fractures, because sometimes it's part of systemic injury, as in polytrauma, you have to be aware of intoxication and the drugs uh, pain from polytrauma. You should look for any occult fracture. You should not be distracted by this finding. Uh, you should counsel sometimes the patient, the family of possible occult fractures. And elderly, it's very important to know the precipitating event uh, in order uh, to uh, uh, optimize your management, okay, uh, by looking for any cardiac, silver vascular, polypharmacy, or alcohol intox intoxication. Uh, you also should look for the mental status because this is very important for rehabilitation protocols. Uh, you also should ask for the level of ambulation, the pre-injury functionality, the handedness. Uh, it, it's uh, important also to do a thorough circumferential exam because part of these injuries actually are open injuries. A part of this injury have an underlying skin condition. Neurological exam is also important. Gofton reported a 26% incidence of incomplete neuropathy in these cases. This be, should be uh, reported and examined, okay, preoperatively. Uh, vascular exam. Now, even that vascular injuries and distal humerus fracture is as some sort of rare uh, injury. It's uncommon, okay. Uh, but if you are, if you find any discrepancy in the pulse between the right and the left limb, okay, you might go for a brachial brachial index, which is uh, usually around 85 and above. Uh, <clears throat> as always, any fracture, you should look for. Uh, you know, all serious fracture you should look for uh, for arm compartment. This is your part of your routine exam. And you have to look for the general condition of the patient, whether the patient had an active infection or there is poor or bad tissue condition, especially in the elderly with possible total elbow arthroplasty, okay, when the fracture is not fixable. Now, there are many classifications actually where established for distal humerus fracture. Some of these are all the classification based on the appearance and the location of the fracture, such as Jupiter classification, Mehnemata classification. But unfortunately, these uh, classifications have the disadvantages of complexity and inter and intra observer reliability. Okay. Now, the, the adopted classification by the Orthopedic Trauma Association is the AO classification, which was modified uh, uh, more than once. Uh, now, the AO classification, it uh, uh, classified fractures based on the location, okay, uh, based on the degree of articular involvement. Uh, and the subclasses are based on fracture line orientation on the direction of the fracture line and the combination degree. But the weakness point is that this classification does not count for fragment height and amount of displacement, does not propose uh, when uh, to go for total orthoplasty and does not give sometimes a clear, clear uh, clarification regarding the complexity of the fracture. Now, uh, you know that uh, the humerus is uh, 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 indicated by number one, neoclassification. Uh, the distal part of the humerus is indicated by number three. So please know that there are type A, type B, type C, okay, fractures. Now, for type A fractures, they are extra articular fracture. The articular surface is intact in type A fracture, okay? In type B fracture, it's partial articular fracture. What do we mean by, by partial articular fracture? It means that still there is a part of the articular surface still attached to the metaphysial and the epiphyseal bone. Okay. And when we are talking about type C, it's complete articular fracture where there is no connection between the articular surface, metaphysial, and the epiphyseal part. Okay. Now we'll go further in details of this classification. I know this, that this is a little bit boring, but actually it's uh, important uh, for the management, for the description, for the planning. 
Now, as we said, one, three, A, A, extraarticular fracture, indicated by number one, okay, which uh, is uh, a physical fracture, a epicondyle fracture. And we have uh, number two, which indicated a medial epicondyle fracture, but without incarceration. Now, th there is too much um, subclasses, we'll not go into the details of this. Uh, and finally, type three, which is medial epicondyle with incarceration. Okay. <clears throat> now, this A1 is just, okay, evolved. Now, regarding type two, type two is the humerus fracture, extra articular metaphysial, metaphysial symbol, symbol metaphysial fracture. Okay. A2 indicates a symbol metaphysial fracture. Okay. Now, when the fracture line is oblique downward and inward, as you can see, uh, it's classified as one with its oblique downward and outward indicated by, uh, as two. And when it's transverse, it is indicated as three. Now, three also further subclassified into, uh, uh, based on, in, on directional displacement. So for posterior displacement, two, two, uh, two, three, two, and for anterior displacement, two, three, three. Now, as you said, A2, A2 means extraarticular symbol metaphysial, okay? Now, when it is not symbol metaphysial, uh, it's classified as A3, okay? Now, A3 means there is a witch, okay? When the witch is symbol and on the lateral side, it is said to be A3, three, one. Now, if the, again, if the fracture is a fragmented wedge, okay, sorry, uh, whether it's lateral or medial, but a simple wedge, it's A31. One. one for lateral, two for medial. As I told you, there is too much subclasses, and this classification is also one of its disadvantages. Uh, its disadvantages, one of it is the complexity, okay? Now, uh, the second type is when the wedge is fragmented. Now, then the fragmentation is lateral, this is one, the fragmentation is, is medial, this is two. And with the fragmentation, uh, 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 when the witch fragmentation is complex, uh, it is classified as A33. Now, the B classes, B class is a partial articular fracture. As we said, part of the articular surface is involved in the fracture, part of the articular surface is not involved, is still intact and attached to the metaphysial and diaphysial bone. Now, for B1, for B1, when the fracture involving just the lateral side, the capitellum is classified as B1, which when it goes uh, more uh, medial involving the trochlea, it's two. And when it is, uh, when it is, uh, uh, there is fragmentation, it's classified as B1, three. Now, <clears throat> the second thing is B2. B2, when the partial articular fracture involving the medial side, okay? When it's transtrochlear, symbol through the medial side, it's classified as B2-1. This, uh, th this is uh, the equivalent of Milch type one. Actually, Milch, when there is uh, involvement of the, 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 later, the lateral part of the trochlea, please notice in this fracture that the lateral part of the trochlea is involved, so this is equivalent to the Milch type two. Please notice that the lateral part of the trochlea is not involved. The lateral part of the trochlea is not involved, and this is classified as Milch type one. <clears throat> Again, uh, we have the transtrochlear symbol the, through the groove, and finally we have the transtrochlear multifragmented, multifragmented fracture. Now B three. Shabab صوت واضح. واضح سيدي واضح تمام هسه بي 3 فراكشر بس احفظوا هذا هذا الرقم بي 3 فراكشر تساوي كورونال شير فراكشر اوكي بي 3 فراكشر تساوي كورونال شير فراكشر اوكي ناو بي 3 1 ذا كابيتال اوكي بي 3 2 ذا تروكليا از فراكشر بي 3 3 از ذا كابيتال اند ذا تروكليا Coming now to the type C, which is the most complex type uh, 
it's when the fracture is involving uh, uh, the articular surface. Okay. Now, C1 is a fracture when, uh, sorry. <clears throat> now, C1 fracture when the fracture is a distal, complete, articular symbol and metaphysial symbol. Okay, so all C fractures are articular fractures. So articular symbol, metaphysial symbol, it's classified as C1. Okay, now articular symbol, metaphysial multifragmentary, it is C2. And when it is articular, complex, and uh, metaphysial complex, it is uh, classified as C3. Now, the difference in between these types, okay, is in the level of the fracture, whether it's high or low, uh, 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 below the fossas. And uh, I think it's a little bit complex classification. We will not go into too much details uh, more than this. Now, <clears throat> the mean and meta classification, as we said, this depends on the fracture shape and fracture line orientation. Uh, you maybe read this uh, every now and then. I think you are more familiar with this classification rather than the O classification. <clears throat> when it's a single, when it's for type one, it's intraarticular fracture. Okay. When it's a single column, it's classified as A based on the shape: high medial column fracture, low medial column fracture, high lateral column fracture, low lateral column fracture, and divergent single column fracture. Now, this type. Keep, uh, please keep this piece of information in, in, in your mind. The olecranon fossa and the coronoid fossa it is, is, is not all the time completely separated by bony septum. In some patients, there is a fenestration between, there's a continuity between the olecranon and the coronoid fossa. And in this specific fracture pattern takes place in this patient. This is called a divergent single column fracture with the fracture extending high uh, from the trochlea extending high through the column. When the fracture involving two columns, it's classified as P-type. So we have high P-type, high T-type, uh, bicolumnar high T-type fracture, bicolumnar low T-type fracture, and bicolumnar Y fracture. As you can see, as you can see the, the fracture is classified based on the shape, and this is an H, bicolumnar H fracture, bicolumnar medial lambda fracture, and bicolumnar lateral lambda fracture. The articular surface fracture, capitulometrically or both, is classified as C. So C class in uh, mean and meta classification is equivalent to B3 in AO classification. Now type two is an extra articular fracture. Okay, it's felt as high flexion, transcolumnar fracture uh, and uh, a low extension uh, a transcolumnar fracture. Uh, you can see this the AP and the lateral. Okay, for each one, for each class of, this, of these, we have, as we have high flexion, we have also low flexion transcolumnar fracture. And as we have a low extension, we have high extension transcolumnar fracture. And we have also high abduction, high abduction fractures. Finally, we have the extracapsular fractures, okay, the medial epicondyle, the lateral epicondyle fractures. We, these are type three fractures. Okay, so what are the management goals for those patients? <clears throat> uh, as you can see that we are dealing with the three parts, okay? We have the articular part. This part needs anatomical reduction. And we have the metaphysial part, okay? Now, this metaphysical part along with the anatomical part need anatomical alignment restoration. And once the articular surface anatomy is restored, the alignment is restored, and we went into a rigid fixation, we should start the patient early rehabilitation. Um, early rehabilitation is very important for the final outcome of the patient. Now, as any fraction orthopedic, we there are different types of management that starts with Non-operative management. Non-operative management is usually reserved for medically unfit patients for surgery, 
elderly who need total arthroplasty with contraindications so you can start them on a, let's say, conservative management, either for a while or for a long time. Uh, uh, third entity is non-displaced fracture, but please be careful of, of, of the about the risk of displacement. So, so you have to weekly follow your patient and this management is abandoned in young active patient. What are the techniques? Casting as in non-displaced fractures, polycranial traction, traction this is in some sort of old modality, uh, collar and cuff, back of bones technique. Okay, now this collar and cuff, you can see on the right side, the wrist is uh, cuffed to the uh, neck and uh, the elbow is kept in a 90 to 120 degrees of flexion. We depend on the gravity. This is the direction of force. We depend on the gravity in order to do a ligament taxis effect and helps with the restoration of the relation of the different fragments. Now, in this line of management, we even in this line of management, we should not uh, delay the beginning or the starting of rehabilitation beyond two weeks. So shoulder and elbow active motion should be started at two weeks. Now, B3 fracture, capitulum fracture, <clears throat> as you can see in this X-ray, have a certain reduction maneuver that you should be aware of. What is block the reduction, as you can see, is the radial head. Radial head is actually uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, uh, standing in, in the way of uh, capitulum sitting back into its place. So the reduction maneuver involves a full extension of the elbow to get the radial head away, supination, and applying some virus forces. Now, if the capitulum if the capitulum is not reduced, you can do some sort of digital manipulation in order to get the capitulum back in its place. Now, after that, you go and did the flexion again, so the radial head will push the capitulum and secure your reduction and keep the capitulum in its anatomical uh, place. This sometimes after doing this reduction maneuver, you might order a CT scan to be sure that you have achieved an anatomical reduction. The second part of the management is the operative part. Now, for the operative management, <clears throat> it's uh, indicated for complex injury with fragmentation, when there is bony instability and soft tissue injury, or if it's the gold standard, okay? Anatomical healing, early range of motion, these will maximize the functional recovery. Now, in compared to the uh, uh, conservative management, it will yield a better outcome and less complication. Now, what's regarding the timing? <clears throat> Early surgery within 48 to 72 hours if the patient is stable and if the soft tissue permits is indicated. What is the advantage of going with an early surgery? The whole surgery will be easier, okay? And there is a lower risk of developing an elbow stiffness and the total calcifications. While in delayed surgery, and even if delayed surgery, it's, it's not advised or recommended to delay the surgery more than two or three weeks. Now, in those patients, you, uh, you, you will not leave the patient alone in the ward. You actually have to check the splint daily, okay? And remove it and do assessment every two to three days. Please. Keep an eye on the soft tissue, on the skin, and keep an eye on the uh, neurovascular status. So you have to do good assessment every time. Uh, now, in those patients, you might consider a static X fix if the surgery is to be further delayed. Uh, and uh, 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 with delayed surgery comes difficulties actually. One of these is, is difficult reduction because of the uh, chaos and metoma that start to form. Uh, there is a chance of increased blood loss, higher chance of increased surgical time, and higher chance of increased HO risk. Okay, I have just a little question for you. If you are in the choice between doing early rehabilitation and risking of displacement, what do you أعمل early rehabilitation بغض النظر إنه إذا ممكن رح يصير عندي displacement أو لا ولا أعمل displacement أو ولا يعني يعني either go with يعني early rehabilitation 
وريسكينج فراكشر ديسبليسمنت ولا لازم استنى لحتى يصير هيلينج بعدين ابلش ريهابيليتيشن وات دو يو ثينك؟ حمزه عطيلة او علي المجالي معك سيدي اه سيدي شو رايك؟ انا برايي ريهابيليتيشن يعني نستارت ريهابيليتيشن عشان استخدم Okay. Thank you for uh, your uh, interaction. But usually in orthopedic, as in any field, another field, you have sometimes you have to count the consequences of your management. Okay. Now, <clears throat> believe me, if you go and do early rehabilitation and the patient ended up with an unhealing fracture, it's going to be uh, a nightmare. Okay, for the patient, for the surgeon. Why? If I wait for the patient to have uh, the healing completed, I can manage the issue of elbow stiffness with some sort of aggressive range of motion, some sort of surgical release. So at all times, okay, nothing should be at the expense of uh, losing the uh, anatomical reduction. So every time we have to weigh things with the advantage of the, and disadvantage. Thank you for interaction, Ali. Operative management. Okay. <clears throat> now, surgical management, type A fractures, CRPP, wires. Uh, it's it's described in the literatures, but really it's a semi-rigid uh, 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 fixation with that needs supplementary casting. Every now, yeah, needs supplementary casting and usually it leads to poor outcome, especially in elderly, okay? Uh, Almost the same for cannulated screws. The gold standard is, is ORF. Okay. Now, as type A fractures are extra articular fracture, we usually start by approaches from the least harmful to the most harmful in the a progressive way. These usually fractures can be accessed by a paratricipital approach or limited tricep splitting approach. Bicolumnar fixation is always recommended, whatever, whether it is parallel or orthogonal plating, if there is no much, even there is a debate about this issue, but there is uh, no much clinical uh, difference between these. But the whole idea is to have a two plates. Now, for the low transcolumnar fracture, okay, we can either go for fixation when, it, when, when it's amenable for fixation. In elderly, sometimes we should consider uh, the arthroplasty as a choice. Now, type B and C fracture, or if is the gold standard, okay. Now, operative management, again, as we said, anatomical reduction of articular surface, anatomical alignment of the joint, we should have a rigid fixation. There's rules how to achieve the maximum rigid fixation we'll talk about in the upcoming slides. And all the whole fixation should be, that should allow a stable early range of motion. Imaging, usually radiograph is adequate in these fractures, but Every now and then we need a CT scan. Okay, CT scan is actually will help us too much with the planning and surgical planning in difficult patterns, such as uh, when there is a coronal fracture of the capitulum or the trochlea with the low types, when there's a segmental uh, articular fractures, and sometimes in the planning of arthroplasty. Now, preoperative assessment at day of surgery. Never take your patient to the theater before checking the soft tissue condition, it's fine. Checking the neurological condition and document that. And of course, we will not forget the prophylactic antibiotic. <clears throat> How, what's the position that we will use for operation? This high, highly depends on the type of uh, uh, approach that's, choose, that's chosen for management. You can operate in a supine position, as you can see, but you should uh, have two polysters, one below the elbow and a one, the other one below the scapula. You should have an assistant that's, ne that's uh, next to you and holding the uh, forearm. The, the other position is uh, a lateral position, okay? Uh, we are mostly do this. We mostly do this uh, uh, position, the lateral position. And sometimes when you have, uh, uh, when you don't have assistance, and if you have a good facility, you can use this aiding device, okay, that uh, uh, helps uh, 
with uh, with patient positioning. Actually, we have this device in Queen Alia. Uh, usually, usually, it's used by the uh, sport team, the three mano system. Now, <clears throat> regarding the operative management, surgical approach. Okay. Now, we say that you should operate 48, 72 hours. This time will allow you to study a fracture well, prepare yourself for all the surgical options and prepare yourself for the most appropriate surgical approach. Approach should accommodate intraoperative findings. For example, when you are doing paratriceptal approach in simple intraarticular fracture. Okay, so in simple articular fracture, I can go for a paratriceptal approach. This approach is less harmful. And at the same time, if I need it, I can extend this approach to be an ulcran ostetomy approach. Another thing is that I will not start, for example, with paratriceptal approach when I have a complex articular fracture. Okay, so I go with ulcran ostetomy uh, approach, which gives, gives me uh, a better exposure of the articular surface. Now, different approaches for the cellular humerus. The posterior approach can be done by straight or curved incision. The curve can be medial or lateral, incision preference. Uh, I have to develop a large lateral and medial fissure flap. There is also the lateral and medial approaches. These are used either for coronal shear fracture or a single column of fracture. Now, also these two approaches, the lateral and the medial approach, uh, uh, the approach is something different from the skin incision. So I can do these approaches from posterior skin incision, okay? Or I can go directly into a lateral skin incision or medial skin incision. What is the difference if I went to this approach to posterior incision? If I go into posterior incision, I have a lower risk, please note, a lower risk of cutaneous nerve injuries with posterior incision. But if I go posterior, I, then I have to go medial or lateral, I am increasing the risk of skin complications with posterior incision. Such a, because I'm, uh, of course, I will I have to develop a large facial cutaneous flaps in order to reach the medial and lateral side. Uh, and these skin complications, facial complications, include, include seroma, okay, and less, 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 less frequently necrosis, skin necrosis. We have also the uh, uh, anterior approach, okay, with, which is uh, rarely used. Uh, now, posterior approach to the humerus, okay. Now, just to make things simple, there are too much, too many names, okay for the posterior approaches to the humerus, okay? Now, in order to make things simple, first type is olecranal osteotomy. We go and do osteotomy through the olecranal process. And the second type is the triceps on. It means that we are not touching the triceps. We are just reflecting, we just, sorry, just reflecting it medially and laterally and go uh, from the sides of the extensor mechanism. So we are not in triceps on approach or paratriceptor approach we are not violating the extensor mechanism. Now in triceps of approach, we are violating the extensor mechanism. It's either by splitting or by reflecting the triceps tendon from its insertion in the olecranon upside or the third approach, which is tongue approach, which is reflecting the extensor mechanism from the uh, uh, myofascial uh, uh, area downside. Distally. <clears throat> now, what are the factors that determine which type of uh, approach to be chosen uh, of these? Number one is the artic and the most important one is the articular visualization required. Okay. Number two is the associated injuries. What what do we mean by associated injuries? For example, if I had an open distal humerus fracture, and I have a semi-total injury, a semi-total injury uh, of the triceps. Okay, or high grade injury of the triceps at, uh, uh, let's say, the tendinous part. So I will not go and do olecranal osteotomy and causing a second hit for the extensor mechanism. Uh, third thing is the patient factor, the age and the demand. So if I think that this patient will not, uh, if I'm planning fixation for an elderly patient, and I think that this patient will end up with some sort of arthroplasty, I will not prefer to go for olecranal osteotomy, of course. And finally, the fracture characteristics, as we see. 
Now, we'll run a stutomy. As you can see, uh, and also in the image, okay, we have very good uh, exposure, very good uh, view visualization of the articular surface. Now, this upside is the olecranon, stutomized olecranon process. Okay, we have here the medium uh, articular surface with the medial column part, the corresponding medial column part. We have here the lateral uh, articular surface with the corresponding lateral column part. Here is the ulnar nerve, as you can see, it's separated, it's isolated. Now, the main advantage is the best visualization of the articular surface. But what is the disadvantages of this approach? Well, you can't assume approach. The, the, the complications are related to the osteotomy itself. By what means? By the malunion, by the spirit of nonunion, and the spirit of metal irritation that I think all of you have frequently seen these, especially the metal irritation part. Now, it's most commonly used for type C fractures. It can be used for type B fractures, especially comminuted one. What are the contraindications? Contraindications is very anterior P3 fracture. As we see, the coronal shield, the partial articular fracture, and the contraindication, second complication, is when the arthroplasty is obscurity. <clears throat> Please have a look at the image on the right side. Okay. Uh, now, not all the sigmoid notch is articulating part. We have the olecranon process, uh, olecranon process. This is the articular part, the olecranon process. We have the coronoid process, this articulate, this is an articular part, and this is an articular part. But let me just okay. But please notice that this area is an unarticular strip. Okay, this area is not articulating with the distal humors. Okay, this is devoid of articular cartilage. This area is named the pair area. Uh, how to identify the pair area? Uh, if you look carefully at the proximal ulna, you will see that the area in this, um, uh, uh, the bone in this area is now, okay. Actually, the diffusal part is wider, proximal, and it's wider distal, but in this area is now. This, <clears throat> how to identify? Uh, uh, now, the approach should be started with ulnar nerve isolation. Uh, uh, another thing, just a point to mention, is the issue of ulnar nerve transposition. Uh, 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 some surgeons prefer to do an nerve transposition, and there was studies uh, on this uh, point regarding the possibility of ulnar neuropathy. Now, uh, Weigers says that there is no uh, uh, related ulnar neuropathy, okay, with ulnar nerve transposition, but Chen was reporting around three or four folds of increase in the risk of ulnar neuropathy with ulnar nerve transposition. So some surgeons do it, some surgeons do not. Okay, now, <clears throat> how can we identify uh, this area as we see it? Uh, by, uh, uh, now we'll go for the technique, okay? But I just want to mention that there is uh, a recent uh, uh, paper in the uh, hand uh, surgery journal, okay, by Francis Etan. It says that the central pair area was consistent in its location. 4.9 millimeter plus minus 1.5 distal to the deepest portion of the trochlear group, a uh, trochlear notch, and 23 plus minus 2.3 millimeter distal to the olecranon tip. Now, how can we do an olecranon osteotomy? We can go either transverse, shabab, or, or I can go in a chevron way, V shape, V shape like, okay? Everything okay have uh, everything has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, <clears throat> we'll discuss uh, this uh, in the next slide. It's important to know that the maximum chevron osteotomy, the angle, we have to be very careful about the angle. Okay, it's around 110 degrees. Please imagine if we make it into a more acute angle, we are violating the. We will violate the. Uh, the articulating cartilaginous part. So we have to be uh, good with our assessment, 110 degrees plus minus 11 degrees. Now the transverse osteotomy, transverse osteotomy is, is really um, uh, much more safe osteotomy, okay? 
but it has its own disadvantages. Usually it is an 18 degree from the axis. Okay, just, okay, 18 degree plus minus 10 degrees uh, from uh, the axis in the coronal plane. Uh, now, uh, in this slide, we'll discuss the uh, pros and cons of, of, of every type of cytotomy. <clears throat> now, how to start, okay, the coronal cytotomy after isolation of the ulnar nerve, as you can see in this image, we can, uh, we, will, we will do a subperiosteal dissection on both sides of the ulnar humeral joint, okay? But please avoid distal dissection in this area, in this area and in this area. Why? Because this is an insertion for the collateral ligaments, the medial and the lateral one, and extensive dissection will lead to uh, some sort of elbow stability, might lead to some sort of elbow instability. Okay, now at the lateral side, we have uh, the anconius in, in this area. Okay, we have the anconius, okay, which takes nerve supply, blood supply from proximal part. We start by doing Subperosteal dissection, okay, on both sides of the humeral joint, uh, we have to uh, protect the articular surface. Now, in order to avoid, many times the anconius is violated. The anconius is important for the posterior lateral rotator instability. So whenever we can uh, uh, keep it safe, okay, we have to do to do this. This can be done by uh, 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 dissecting the anconius and elevate the anconius as a flap, okay. And, and later on, to, to, to elevate it with the osteotomized part and the corresponding triceps tendon and triceps muscle up, upside in order to keep it intact. Now, <clears throat> after elevating the anconius, after identifying the lateral and the medial side uh, of uh, the alnohumeral joint, uh, 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 we can do capsulotomy, medial and lateral capsulotomy, and uh, we can pass a uh, gauze goes this link, goes this link through this narrow area. You can pull this link uh, downward, okay? Now, the area where it stops, okay, uh, it is uh, the pair area. How to start the osteotomy? The osteotomy should be started with a micro saw. Two thirds of the osteotomy is done by micro saw. The last one third is done by osteotomes. Please show up at the saw right downside, okay? You can see the triangular shape of the uh, 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 articular uh, part, okay, and sigmoid notch, uh, the triangular shape of the sigmoid notch. So, if 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 we if we went with the micro saw in a vertical direction, actually, this part this part will not be osteotomized, okay, but this part might be osteotomized, and we are violating the articular cartilage. So. We go in some sort of inclination, okay? We go in some sort of inclination uh, at both sides. Uh, a good trick to do is to, uh, after marking of the osteotomy shape, is to do drilling, the drilling at the apex of the osteotomy in order to be very precise with your, with your osteotomy. As we said, two thirds done by micro saw. After doing this, okay, we can continue with the osteotome just before, just before doing the, completing the osteotomy, you can go with K-wire and do multiple uh, perforations, okay? And this will uh, decrease the risk of unplanned propagation of the osteotomy. Uh, now, finally, uh, at, 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 at the step of separation, uh, it's advised to be done by two osteotomes, one in the medial side, one in the lateral side, and to be both elevated at the same time. This is to avoid any propagation. Now, as we said, this is what described as the chevron osteotomy. There is also the transverse osteotomy. It's more, much more easier. Now, comparing chevron osteotomy versus transverse osteotomy, the articular violation, okay? The articular violation is more with chevron osteotomy, while transverse osteotomy is more safe, okay? Uh, technical easiness, the chevron osteotomy is challenging. It's not easy, while transverse osteotomy is easier. But as we said, we look for the consequences of each one. With chevron osteotomy, you can have a good interdigitation of the uh, osteotomized fragment, and this will uh, strongly help us with the final uh, uh, 
uh, repair of the osteotomy. Hamza, you are asking something. يعطيك العافية سيدة. الله يعافيك يا حمزة. كنت بسأل عن البري دريلينج لل الكرينيون سيدة عشان سكرو. يس. بعمل بس للاستيوتومي ولا وذين ذا استيوتومي. يس هسا يس اوكي. هسا راح نحكي عن هاي النقطة بس. دكتور محمد اسمح لي بس. إذا في مجال كونه يعني وقت المحاضرة ماشي الأمور إذا في الأسئلة تكون بآخر المحاضرة ممكن تكون أمور عشان ما يصير في انترابشن شو رأيك؟ اه تمام ضلنا هو كمان سيدي بعض النقاط يعني ممكن يصيروا عنها الشباب راح ويل بي ديسكاس ليتر اون يعني ان ذا ليكتشر ممكن نختصر نعم ممكن نختصر الله يعطيك العافيه ثانك يو سيدي الله يعافيك ف زي ما حكينا انه بالشيفرون استوتومي يو ار اتشيفينج انتر ديجيتيشن يو ار اتشيفينج ستابيلتي وات كايند اوف ستابيلتي روتيشنال ستابيلتي سو از يو كان سي ذس وين ذا استوتومي از فيتينج ان ذا في شيبد ان ذا اجيسنت في شيبد اوكي Uh, surface okay this will lead to rotational stability another thing it will provide medial and lateral stability so at uh, the final fixation it will not go medial it will not go lateral and these things unfortunately cannot be achieved with transverse osteotomy that's why is chiver osteotomy is done more than transverse osteotomy uh, we talked about anconius denervation please keep the anconius in the flap with the ulcrano process and the triceps Now, stotomy fixation at the end of surgery, this can be done by different modalities, either plate or a tension band or cannulated screw. Uh, uh, some people would do pre-drilling, pre-drilling, okay, before doing the stotomy. They apply the plate, okay, on the uh, uh, proximal ulna, and after that, they go with the stotomy, and this will make the, 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 the fixation of the stotomy at the end of surgery easier. Uh, the screw, the cannulated screw, uh, the cannulated screw has the problem of 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 uh, uh, of uh, uh, now the proximal ulna is, has a little bit varus. Okay, now so when the screw is engaging distally, uh, as you know, the screw is a more more straight structure. Okay, so as it's passing distally and engaging. The virus part of the proximal ulna, this might lead to a deformation on the osteotomy. This is a drawback of the screw. This might, might lead into a mal reduction. Okay, uh, this is just to emphasize what we said. Please note that when the osteotomy is acute angle, there is a risk of uh, 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 violating the articular cartilage. <clears throat> Uh, this is the downside is the classical principle that you know about uh, the, the tension band, which is the most commonly used maybe by us. Now, the second approach, as we said, the triceps on approach. So please notice that we are not we are not violating the extensor mechanism. We just are shifting it in slightly medial or slightly lateral, depending on the exposure we need. Again, all posterior approaches they need. They need a rear identification. Uh, we can go for medial and lateral elevation, medial uh, from the medial intermuscular uh, symptom, okay, from the ulnar nerve, uh, and lateral from the lateral intermuscular symptom. Now, what exposure, what kind of exposure this uh, approach provides? Uh, it provides good exposure for the columns. It provides a good exposure for the cranon fossa, as you can see. And there is a limited articular exposure. Now, how can we improve the articular exposure by creating uh, uh, what's known as a void uh, window? Again, to keep the anconius innervated, vascularized, we can dissect between it and the extensive digital and communist, okay, and elevate it. And this will give us uh, uh, an articular, we increase the articular exposure. But of course, it will not be, it will be some sort of limited uh, articular exposure. Now, again, advantages, disadvantages, all, all everything, every decision you make, you have to look for the advantages and disadvantages. Advantages this, uh, if this approach is intact triceps, what does this mean? This means an earlier rehabilitation, earlier range of motion, uh, preserved unconscious, avoiding all the complications of osteotomy. Okay. And at the same time, This is a safe approach that at any time 
can be advanced and converted into an olecranon stuttering approach. And this approach at the humoral side, it can be extensile as Gerwin modification, Gerwin approach. Gerwin approach is, um, is, 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 is uh, the, the, the extension of this approach proximal that expose around 90 or 95% of the humerus by just shifting the triceps from the lateral side. Now, <clears throat> again, the disadvantages is the limited articular exposure. Oh, and of course, it will not be adequate as approach to manage uh, type C3, type C3 fracture, especially the complex one. Now, as the paratricepital approach, as we said, is triceps on, we are not relating triceps. We here we start with the uh, approaches that are violating the extensor mechanism. First one is the triceps splitting approach. We do a midline split through the triceps tendon, no articular surface exposure, except with modification, which is partial olecranon tip exigen. So, so you might do a partial exigen of the olecranon tip in order in this approach. If you are forced to go with this approach, as we said, and when the soft tissue trauma uh, is forcing you to certain approach, uh, so you might go with this step, which is partial electron tip exogen. Uh, now elevated part of the triceps should be repaired to the olecranon process through interosseous tunnels. Uh, it has a proximal and distal extension, but okay, it's slightly the proximal extension is slightly limited. Uh, and the distal extension is uh, by uh, extending the in incision, by incising the triceps tendon, elevating part of the sharpest tendon that, that to the bone. Now, advantages, this is a technically, technically easy approach, okay? And uh, if, if, if uh, 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 fixation is not possible, as an elderly patient and the choice of arthroplasty was made, uh, you can go with this approach safely, but it has disadvantages is that as the extensor mechanism is violated, so you have to do uh, uh, protection for the triceps repair. And this, of course, will lead to maybe delayed rehabilitation. And uh, as we said, the uh, issue of limited articular exposure. Now, sometimes there is an issue with, with healing of the triceps tendon. So, so there, is, there was something called uh, Gishwind modification. Gishwind modification is uh, incorporating a flake of bone, flake elevation, of bone from the olecranon process in order to facilitate healing. Now, uh, Shabab, oh, strength of extensor mechanism in tricep splitting approach versus olecranon osteotomy approach. What do you think, uh, who, who will make a, a guess or who, who will answer the question? What do you think when we are comparing the strength of the extensor mechanism between the tricep splitting approach and the olecranon osteotomy? Which one will have a weaker extensor mechanism? or there will not be. Okay, to save time, there is. Triceps splitting CD, if you have more weakness. No, actually both approaches, both approaches when we're compared to each other, we have, the patient has almost the same extensor strength. <clears throat> now, again, more and more aggressive with the approaches, we go into trap approach. What is trap approach? Triceps reflecting anconius pedicle. Okay, now in this approach, we are elevating the anconius and the triceps tendon from their insertion. Please notice that this is the anconius. This is the triceps tendon, this area, and this triceps muscle. Uh, and this area is completely elevated from the proximal ulna and the distal uh, humerus. Uh, completely detaching the triceps from proximal ulna along, along with anconius. Uh, now, Kuchar interval is used, again, as we say, to develop the distal lateral flap to, in order to elevate the anconius with the triceps. The medial is created, the medial flap is created by sharp subperiosteal dissection. Advantage of this approach is a good exposure of the elbow joint, protection of the anconius in your vascular supply, avoiding the complications of osteotomy healing, trochlear sulcus. Trochlea can be used as a tim trochlear sulcus, sorry, 
trochlear circuit is not trochlear. Trochlear circuit can be used as a template for reduction. But nothing comes for free. This advantages, okay, we are avoiding certain complications, but we are encountered with the problem of triceps healing uh, that is violated, and there is a risk of extensor weakness and dehiscence. Now, again, we are elevating from distal to proximal. There is another approach that's called Van Gorder approach. Van Gorder approach, it's again, the extensor mechanism is violated, but instead of violating it distally, it's violated proximal, okay? At the myotendinous junction, and it's all in a VY shape, and the uh, whole distal segment is reflecting, is reflected distally in a tongue uh, shape. So this is why it's called triceps tongue approach. It's commonly used for arthroplasty, indicated for or if there is a high grade or complete triceps injury. Okay, this is a figure from Campbell. Okay, that uh, just emphasizing the trap approach. These notes again, the coin is the triceps tendon and the triceps muscle. <clears throat> lateral approach. When lateral approach is utilized or used, lateral approach are used when there is a partial articular fracture involving the lateral column or in coronal shear fracture. Okay. Now, <clears throat> as we said, we can go either through direct lateral incision, but please be careful with the cutaneous nerves, or we can go through the posterior incision, but we have to accept the risk of possible soft tissue complications. The approach is developed between the extensor carpal naris and the anconius. The extensor, uh, no, I think, okay. Uh, now it's important for this approach uh, between the extensor torum communis and the anconius, sorry. Uh, now how, how to demarcate actually the borders between these two muscles, okay. You just, it's not actually uh, just like it's drawn in the box, okay, with uh, a well organized, well separated muscles. All of them are blended together to each other, okay. Now we can identify the approach. Please notice that this, this, this thin fatty stripe, okay. This thin fatty stripe is actually located between the extensitorum communis and the anconius, okay. This is the landmark for our approach, uh, or we can identify it by looking for the perforating branch of the posterior interosseous nerve, uh, sorry, interosseous uh, artery. Uh, in this approach, it's very important to keep the forearm pronated, okay, in order to take the radial, the PIN nerve uh, distally and away from my approach. Some describe excessive uh, uh, communis splitting, maybe safer, okay, approach. Why it's safer? Because we are going more anteriorly. Again, we say that uh, a, a surgeon with a good knowledge of the anatomy is a good surgeon. We are shifting a little bit away from uh, the lateral collateral ligament complex, okay? So some describe the excess thoracomy split as a safer. Now, arthrotomy is done at the equator of the capitellum and in line with the radiocapitellar joint, okay. <clears throat> now the medial approach again, is either medial incision or posterior scan incision. Please be careful the medial antibrachial cutaneous branches, indications, medial column fracture, trochlear fracture, coronoid fracture, medial epicondyle fracture, and nerve again, should be identified, reflected anteriorly. Now the flexor pronator mass released from the medial supracondylar ridge to the level until the level of the medial epicondyle. Please be careful the medial collateral ligament complex, okay? And after elevated of the point ridge, we can go by doing sepulting, okay, distally, and we will elevate the flexor pronator mass of the MCL that is in the floor of this approach, and the arthrotomy is done anterior to the anterior bundle of the MCL. Now, <clears throat> I think you are hearing me frequently say, saying that we should have a good rigid fixation. Uh, there was a rules, uh, rules for uh, achieving this goal, okay? So for union, good and full elbow mobility after severe fracture of the 
this is a humorous, two principles must be satisfied. Two principles. The first principle is fixation in the distal fragment must be maximized, maximized as much as we can. Second thing is that all fixation in distal fragments, all fixation in distal fragments should contribute to stability between the distal fragment and the shaft. Okay. Now, <clears throat> eight technical ways uh, by which these principles are met, the two mentioned principles. Number one, it's important to, 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 to note that not every time you can achieve these, but you have to achieve as much as you can of these, okay? Uh, the first thing is that every screw in the distal fragment should pass through a plate. Second thing is engage a fragment on the opposite side. So you go from medial, you should engage the lateral if you can. <clears throat> it's also fixed, the lateral that's also fixed to the plate or, or screw the lateral goes medial, the, the medial that's also fixed to the plate. Number three is as many screws as possible should be placed in the distal fragments. Each screw should be as long as possible. Each screw should engage as many articular fragments as possible. The screws in the distal fragment should look together by interdigitation, by interdigitation and creating a fixed angle structure. Plates should be applied such that compression, compression is achieved at the supracondylar level for both columns. The, place, the plate must be strong enough and stiff enough to resist breaking or bending before union occur at the supracondylar level. Now, this is just a, a technical surgical techniques. Okay, you can see that we have the uh, medial articular part, the lateral articular part. The surgeon is going with a K wire from the regarding it goes through the fracture, okay, from the medial side of the fracture to the lateral side, okay, and the uh, the wire is pulled until it's flushed at the articular surface, and the same thing is done at the medial side. Now the two wires are used, as you can see, and uh, to 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 do joysticking, okay, um, and after achieving an anatomical reduction, as you can see, we can use a forceps, uh, a reduction a point reduction forceps. Uh, please be careful. There's something important you have to know. Uh, this is applied when with caution especially when there is a multi-fragmentation of the articular surface. Why? Because you don't want to end up with a narrow articular surface, okay, that will affect the final outcome. Uh, <clears throat> again, after securing, uh, after uh, uh, doing the reduction, the k wires might be advanced in the opposite direction, okay. This is for provisional fixation. After that, the uh, 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 fixation is secured with an articular screw that's usually put in either a positional way or in a lag way. This depends on the, as we said, on the fracture shape, fracture geometry. Now, uh, as you can see, we start from the most dangerous side, goes to the least dangerous side. So we go from the middle side in order to maximize the protection of the ulnar nerve. After achieving the articular surface reduction, and fixation, we go into a uh, fixation of the metaphysial part. You can see uh, restoring the anatomical alignment, anatomical alignment <clears throat> of the fractured part of the column. And then uh, starting by either a medial or lateral plate, uh, the surgeon started the medial plate and ending up with doing uh, a lateral plate, or we can do a medial plate and the posterior lateral blade, as you can see. Okay, so this is the parallel configuration, and this is the orthogonal configuration. Uh, uh, if you remember at the beginning of the, uh, why it's important to know the anatomy again and again, this area, so the plate can be extended almost to the level of the articular surface. Why? Because this area is devoid of cartilage. Okay, but after uh, putting your plate, please, you have to make sure that the radial head is not impinging, okay, and it's not causing any block of uh, extension or unblock of motion uh, in place. Another thing is that your screws are going from posterior side, okay? Your screws are going from posterior side. So please be careful not to violate the articular surface of the capitellum anteriorly. Uh, another thing is uh, be careful about the fossa. Sometimes 
we might go with a screw through the uh, maybe the coronoid process, uh, coronoid fossa or the olecranon fossa, and this will cause this will impinge on the olecranon or the coronoid processes. Okay, and will cause uh, uh, some sort of uh, movement limitation. Now, just to conclude, I know it's a tough subject, too many details, but just to conclude, in type A fracture, 3.5 or 4 millimeter screws are more reliable than K-wares. For type B fracture, for simple isolated letter column injury, single plate might be used. Our screws alone, for type C fractures, two plates are needed for adequate strength, increased by placing them at right angles to each other. Uh, for firm fixation, the lateral plate should reach down to the joint line, as we emphasized, in order to maximize the fixation strength. Uh, now, even that we have, uh, now the classical textbooks of orthopedic describing using uh, a DCB, 3.5 DCB on the stereolateral side or the lateral side and using a recon plate, okay, on the medial side, okay. Uh, but now we have uh, the technology of looking plates that, um, uh, that actually helped much with with the, the fixation, but even yani, shabab, even with with these anatomical plates, um, many times they need some sort of uh, bending in order to accommodate for the uh, shape and the anatomy of the stellar humerus. Now, whether you go for orthogonal, parallel, or triple plating, no clinical significance, no clinically significant difference between these. Uh, modalities okay some says that orthogonal plates are fixing the fracture in the two planes uh, while the parallel plates are more rigid at the sagittal plane some describes triple plating all in all okay these are whatever you are familiar with okay whatever your fracture permits for fixation go and do that <clears throat> here's a kind of a complex fracture you can see this uh, small plate, <laughs> this small recon shaped plate, this area, th this fracture, complex fracture associated with uh, a capitellum segment, spread capitella segment, okay? So sometimes we need three plates, triple plating, okay? This is based on this fracture geometry. So be dynamic in your thinking, be clear uh, in your targets, in your goals for these fracture. Now, Every now and then we, we encounter surgical challenges. Okay, one of these is metaphysial bone loss. When there is metaphysial bone loss, as an open fracture, for example, sometimes we go for shortening. Okay, now when we go for shortening, we end up uh, with a deformed olecranon uh, fossa. Okay, uh, so we have to recreate the olecranon fossa or reshape the steric humerus to accommodate the olecranon process. Consider grafting. So, as we said, planning is very important. You have to know uh, uh, what your goals. You have to be prepared for any surprises. Interoperatively, you have to do a good plan. Now, the, the, another surgical challenge is when the surgical, when uh, the surgical fixation or rigid fixation was not achieved by double plating. Go and do triple plating. Okay, this is. Uh, recommended by Gofton, Jupiter, and Mini, and associated coronal plane fractures also might need a triple plating. Go for triple plating, pre-contoured plate, uh, not matching the anatomy all the time. So keep benders close. Be careful with screw trajectory, because the problem with with looking plates is that the screw trajectory is predetermined. Okay, so sometimes you uh, end up with the screw in the uh, olecranon, the coronoid fossa, or in the or violating the articular uh, cartilage. Now there is uh, uh, also there is the development of the technology where you can uh, do the same locking principle, but with changing the uh, trajectory of the screw. <clears throat> B3 fracture. B3 fractures can be accessed by a Lateral approach, as we said, by posterior or lateral incision, okay, uh, or by posterior approach. Now, reduction maneuver, we talk about it. Uh, after achieving the reduction, we go for provisional fixation with thin wire. And definite fixation is, is with countersunk screws, okay. The countersunk screws can be put either to either 
through the articular cartilage, okay, anterior to posterior, or we can go from posterior to anterior, okay, which is more mechanically stable, the posterior to anterior one. The posterior to anterior screw is more biomechanically stable. Now, this is Kocha Lorenz classification. As you can see in type one, there is a large uh, uh, osteochondral. Uh, the, large, the articular is fractured with, with a good cuff of, uh, let's see, subchondral bone. In type two fracture, this is just an, like an eggshell, okay, fracture, and that sometimes just excised. In type three fracture, there's comminution. In type four fracture, type four fracture, the, the fracture is extending into, into the trochlea. Okay. <clears throat> These fracture again should be studied well. Uh, uh, why? Because sometimes in capitular fracture, you are faced with uh, uh, with 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 the posterior comminution and impaction, and in such cases, you will not able to restore the anatomical location and to achieve anatomical reduction of the capitellum unless you do this impaction. You good you do a good uh, grafting of this area in order to have a good base for the articular cartilage, the capitellum to sit on. Okay. At sometimes when the combination even extensive and severe, you should put a posterior plate in order to form a, a, a good support for the articular piece. Uh, type four, type four is as you see a large fragment involving the trochlea. You in these fractures, particular fracture, you need a good exposure, and this good exposure can be achieved by LCL release. So we can release the LCL from its origin. Again, as we said, good planning is very important because if you are planning for LCL release, you should be prepared with all the instruments you need, anchors or whatever fixation, fixation method. So uh, we can do LCL release and make the elbow opening and hinging on the medial side, the medial collateral ligament, or we can go the alternative is to go with two separate approaches, one medial and one lateral approach. And a third, which is a good choice actually, is to do olecran osteotomy, which can achieve really uh, uh, a good satisfactory result. Uh, also arthroscopic, arthroscopic percutaneous approach is also described in the literature for these injuries. Now, uh, I will go through this quickly. I will leave you uh, the slides to read. There are potential pitfalls uh, 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 and the preventions for oral fibrocytomerous fracture. Please be careful about the skin condition, the swelling, the fracture blisters. Give an eye, good eye, on soft tissue assessment. Uh, please be careful about unrecognized coronal shear fractures. These are intraoperative surprises that you uh, uh, most probably would would like to avoid. Uh, failure to recognize bone loss in open fractures. This is, uh, again uh, can be uh, can be avoided by going doing good uh, studies, good CT scan study for the fracture, ineffective surgical exposure. No, you have to know exactly what we want from your uh, approach, what kind of surgical exposure you need. Uh, irreparable distal humerus fracture with communication and dystopian and elderly key in mind. Radial nerve injury and replacement of long lateral plate. So please be careful about the measures that we talk about and the ratios, the percentage ratios, because sometimes you are dealing with a different body habitus, okay, and different ages. Uh, inadequate fixation of low transcolumnar fracture. When it's low transcolumnar fracture, try to place as many screws as possible in the distal articular fragment. Uh, screws placed across the olecranon fossa causing impingement, supracondylar. Then union, sometimes we should do a shortening, okay? And it's important also when we attaching the articular segment to the metaphysial part to do compression, to do compression. It's important to do compression. Uh, and finally, ulnar neuropathy, please be careful. Assess uh, the uh, ulnar nerve preoperatively uh, and postoperatively and counsel your patient all the time regarding the possible complications. Now, total elbow arthroplasty, just one slide. Uh, it's indicated when orifice is not attainable in elderly due to osteopenia, combination articular fragmentation or pre-existing conditions. Contraindications are active infection, insufficient soft tissue coverage, young active patients. Now, 
there is something as hemiarthroplasty is indicated in the partial articular fractures when fixation cannot be done with severe is severe comminution. Okay, the advantage is that absence of polyethylene where deep pre osteolysis or aseptic loosening, but still there is no literature evidence regarding hemiarthroplasty. And then if you can see a constraint, total elbow arthroplasty prosthesis. Okay, on the right side, you can see this is hemiarthroplasty composed of the capitular, metallic part, and trochlear metallic part fracture, fractures uh, such as the still humerus fracture is serious fracture. Um, uh, it's bad fracture, need, especially the complex one that needs high level of expertise and the, that carries a risk of complications that includes uh, non-union, elbow stiffness, Certification, wound complications, infections, and neuropathy, problems led to the osteotomy, and the complication that's associated with arthroplasty. Uh, I, I, I hope that I added something to you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening. And uh, if anybody has uh, a question. دكتور محمد الله يعطيك العافية الله يعافيك سيدي يعني بداية حاب أشكرك كثير الشكر جزيل الشكر بصراحة على هاي المحاضرة القيمة جدا والوقت اللي أعطيته ويعني وقولها ليس والذين يعلمون والذين لا يعلمون يعني هاي محاضرتك دليل أو إشي مهم هو فيها مسج مهم للشباب إنه عشان تعرف عن موضوع معين لازم تكون قارئ وقارئ يعني جيد ومتمكن ومهتم بالتفاصيل ويعني بصراحة الله يعطيك العافية من محاضرات مميزة جدا وأنا حاب أشكرك بصراحة أنك أعطيت الوقت هذا كله وأعطيت المعلومات بصراحة يعني you delivered بحرفية وضحت النقاط المهمة بالأسلوب أسلوب محاضر ممتاز ما شاء الله عليك ففعلا يعني الله يعطيك ألف عافية ويقويك إن شاء الله Thank you sir, I really appreciated your comment Thank you very much for supporting our scientific program يعطيك العافية دكتور محمد معك دكتور ناصر الحسبان هلا هلا دكتور ناصر الله يعافيك يا هلا سيدي بعد اذنك بدي اسالك بالبوست اوب بيريود اباوت رينج اوف موشن يعني از ذيرز ا رول فور البو هنج بريس اند اف ذيرز يعني ان ويتش سكيجول وي ستارت انكريس ذا رينج اوف موشن يو يو شود ستارت اكتف رينج اوف موشن ثانك يو يو شود ستارت اكتف رينج اوف موشن نوت ا باسيف رينج اوف موشن And it should be started as soon as possible, within three to five days. Okay. Now, a hinged elbow brace is not a routinely practice. It's not a routine practice, actually. This will depend on your uh, fracture characteristics. Okay. This will depend on the approach uh, you choose on uh, any possible violation of the uh, collateral ligaments. Okay. So this is actually a dynamic decision, not a static decision, but It's it's not a routine practice in the post-operative period. Ma'am, thank. You. I hope that this answers your question. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 مع انه يعني انا صراحه مش فاهم ليش ممكن نبلش في اسرع مع انه الكونتينيو ماسكلر هيلينج المفروض انه يكون اقوى من البون هيلينج هي اول سؤال ثاني سؤال عن الانر نير ترانسبيشن از ذير اني انديكيشن تو دو ويث يعني انديكيشن بري اوف انديكيشن لانه في ناس بتحكوا انه اذا كان في عندي بري اوبريتيف سيمبتوماتيك انر نيوروباثي المفروض انه انا اعمل ترانسبيشن عند الانر نير ترانسبيشن اوكي العفو صديقي هسه Uh, something in the literature, level one evidence, whether you have to do or not to do, there is no, okay, there's, there's no such practice, but uh, uh, relying on a major textbooks like Rockwood, okay, the editor in Rockwood, he would do it as a part of his routine practice, okay, he do it as part of his routine practice, and learn your transposition, okay, but as I told you, there is controversy regarding this issue, Some people say that they, it will not uh, uh, increase the 
uh, it will not risk the ulnar nerve and causing any ulnar neuropathy. Some other uh, says that increase, as we said, uh, three or four folds, increase the risk of ulnar neuropathy. So at the end, it's, it is uh, a surgical, uh, surgical preference, actually, whether do it or not. Now, regarding the easiness of the trap approach, okay? Now, trap approach is actually easy because you are just uh, doing a soft tissue elevation. There is no that much steps uh, as in the uh, 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 chevron osteotomy. Chevron osteotomy, you have very precise with the osteotomy, with the angle of osteotomy, with the levels of the osteotomy, with the direction of osteotomy, okay? You have to do pre-contour, uh, pre-drilling if you are plan to do, uh, uh, if, uh, plan to do a plate fixation of the osteotomy, okay? While trap is just <laughs> a soft tissue procedure, actually. So, sorry, I mean, just uh, a soft tissue elevation, okay? So, you, osteotomy, in osteotomy, you are creating another fracture and you are fixing another fracture, okay? So, but uh, as, I saw, as, I, as I told and a bit uh, frequently, you have to know what are the target of your approach? What are the limits? of your approach. I hope I, ans I answered your question, Dr. Ali. Possibly, but I know the answer is very clear. But I have a question about the rehab program after the trap and the electron system. We will start with rehabilitation in the case of the trap, is it? Yeah, and no. Rehabilitation will be maybe the electron system because uh, it's more rigid fixation, okay? And now the trap, the problem with the trap is, is the uh, healing of the extensor mechanism. This is actually the, the, the problem with the trap, okay? So you might go with uh, an earlier rehabilitation with olecranal osteotomy rather than a trap. So you will not go, for example, into a full degree of flexion. You will not risk your repair sometimes and when you're doing a tendinous repair, okay, to the bone, rather than when you are rigidly fixing an osteotomized bone. شكرا زيد شكرا لك. العفو ثانك يو. محمد الله يعطيك العافيه. الله رائع الله يعافيك سيدي. الله يعافيك سيدي. شباب في احد يظل عنده اي سؤال؟ الله اكبر. الله اكبر. اي سؤال؟ الله اكبر. سيدي انت انا شرح كافي وافي ابري سيرجي حد ال point of view for this subject الله يعطيك العافية ثانك يو شباب يعني ايفن اي حدا عنده سؤال او يخطر باله سؤال بعد المحاضرة يبعث لي ام ريدي تو انسر اني كويستشن ان شاء الله يعني نقدر هيك يعني نفيدكم حاب اشكركم جميعا على الحضور صحيح يعني كثير اسماء يعني هيك الواحد تاق انه يرجع يلتقيهم مرة ثانية وكثير اسماء صحيح يعني فاميلير معها اسمحوا لي كمان اوجه شكر لزميلي السابق باربيل عمر الطراونه صحيح هي ديد فيري جود فيفر وذ مي بموضوع اللوجيستكس يعني في اربيل شكرا عمر واتمنى تكون سامعني اي ثينك هو بين الموجودين صح؟ انا قريت اسمه موجود عمر موجود موجود ثانك يو دكتور ناصر فور يور ايفورتس بصراحه يعني هذا ساينس بروجرام وشكرا الشباب فور يور اتنشن دكتور مثلنا سيدي بركان في اي ملاحظه سيدي لا سيدي الله يعطيك الف عافيه الله يعافيك سيدي الله يسلمك طيب يعطيكم العافيه جميعا نلتقيكم ان شاء الله نستمر الجهود بهذه الطريقه ان شاء الله يعني الله يعطيكم العافيه ان شاء الله سيدي نلتقيكم الله يعطيك العافيه سيدي شكرا الاربعاء القادم باذن الله يعطيكم